Good morning, or afternoon. My name is Kent Hargrave, and I would like to welcome you to my capstone presentation. I've been a student at WGU for the last 18 months in the MBA program focused on management and strategy. Um, I will show you why I believe I am prepared to take on the role of the CEO of a mid-sized hospital or a COO of a health healthcare organization. My career choice is to obtain a position as a CEO in a hospital or a COO within a hospital system. Uh, $250 million for a hospital or a $750 million organization if it's a healthcare system. I believe in 20 years of healthcare experience and having worked on both the vendor side as well as the provider side of the healthcare system, I have a unique set of capabilities to be able to perform this position quite well. Um, I've held many positions in, in healthcare. I've been a clinical manager, hospital IT executive. I've been a vendor executive responsible for helping institutions advance their ability to care for patients. I have published papers in the areas of efficient laparoscopic surgical practices, surgical outcomes, improved operating room efficiencies, and wireless technologies. I also hold a patent for delivering event-driven patient data to physicians on handhelds in real time. So I invite you now to join me for the next few minutes uh, so I can share my experiences with you to show that I am the right leader for your healthcare system. A few of the salient points of a COO or CEO in any healthcare organization um, it is foremost is the strategic planning and goal setting for that organization. Um, you have to plan for the future uh, to be able to, to keep that healthcare institution going forward. When I was at Overlake Hospital Medical Center, I was tasked to create the five year strategic plan for all technologies within the hospital IT, surgical, plant facilities, and radiology, just to name a few. Um, creating a culture of ownership and caring. Um, uh, we're a hospital system. Uh, that's what the culture has to be. I also believe that it's leading by example. Um, taking that extra minute to actually walk the patient to their appointment. Taking the time to listen to your employees and their concerns and going out of your way to make them feel important. When you do this, then your employees will mirror that behavior. We honored three employees who stopped to help a person who had jumped off an overpass trying to commit suicide. This was not done during their job. But we felt we wanted to thank them for their personal efforts in trying to save this person. We just wanted to say thank you for being a caring person. It was amazing at the impact it had on the medical center when we brought these three folks up in front of them and simply said thank you. Um, the medical center felt pride um, and very proud of, of these three. And, and the employees who were in the audience, uh, I think, went back and, and did a little better job at their, at their positions, um, knowing. That, that their overall impact on the world uh, didn't just stop inside the hospital. Efficient healthcare systems. It's called healthcare. We need to provide outstanding care, um, yet we also need to make a profit. Many hospitals only view and take a look at the profitability, and oftentimes they miss that caring. When I was at Overlake, we created on our board two separate sub subsections of the board. Um, we created the profit side, and then we created the patient care side. Um, so we spent equal time taking a look at patient care as well as the profitability. If you're not profitable, we can't provide care. Community involvement. The hospital really is part of the community. Um, it's security, knowing that your emergency services are right there. It's a place that loved ones can be cared for close to home. Um, in being able to prove this, we had donations uh, as small as 5 or $10 um, and as large as $7 million at, at, one, of, at one of our facilities. Policy and legal adherence. We must act, act ethical and we must act legal. It's uh, the responsibility of the CEO and the COO to show that these are what we do. Understanding the competitive environment. Hospitals compete within a small geographic location and it is very important to understand what that competitive environment is. Uh, I will show you uh, through some of these future slides that I do understand that role. Leading people in teams. So I've spent most of my life in leadership roles. Uh, Eagle Scout Project, Senior Lifeguard, uh, as a, a boat operator teaching the other LA County lifeguards how to be boat operators, uh, delivering navigational systems to submarines, to leading healthcare organizations to become the best that they can be. Um, within a healthcare organization, I've been a clinical manager, an IT executive, and a hospital executive. Um, the IT executives oftentimes focus on the technology pieces, whereas a hospital executive steps back and takes a look at the entire overall organization. And I've had the unique experience to be able to do both. Um, in each of these areas, I believe a leader, you need to lead by example. 
Um, a couple small examples is uh, when I was managing sports medicine, we had a lot of leaves out in our driveway. Uh, people were slipping. I went out and I swept the leaves. As the clinical manager over a $10 million clinic, I'm out there sweeping leaves. When I came back in, the staff said, wow, we've never had a manager here at BM do that. Um, and they, they viewed me a little differently after that day. I would fold towels in the physical therapy area. Twofold. Number one, got the towels folded. But number two, I was able to see my employees interact with the patients and I was able to interact with the patients. Um, again, allowing them to, to see that I was really involved in that care. Um, again, it comes down to if you're not willing to lead the way in quality, how do you expect your staff to follow along? Um, and I really think it's important that you are out there showing your staff what to do. A um, number of, of, of examples of being able to do that. Developing sustainable solutions. Um, I think the biggest piece about being able to develop a sustainable solution is to first understand the problem. Um, I think that falls in a lot of IT realms. I grew up in IT. And I think a lot of times we come up with a solution in which we think we know the problem, and we've completely missed the problem. I worked on a Star Wars project in which uh, we, were, we were producing 10,000 units. And the learning curve, there's a learning curve calculation that gives you benefit for every time you double output. Um, the calculation takes in, into account 8,000 units and the next one is 16,000 units. And, and that's a pretty steep level of the, unit, the learning curve. And so I realized that the problem was we were losing the benefit of those 2,000 extras. So I created a program to do those calculations. Another problem is that we were trying to get data from a mainframe onto a PC. No one had done that before. I, I, literally no one had done that before. Once I understood what the problem was, the solution was actually fairly easy. They were trying to get a small amount of very specific data out of the mainframe. Um, so I wrote a program that went out to the mainframe, emulated the mainframe, downloaded the program, and then, and, and then dumped it into a, a, a data file so we could extract that. Sometimes those sustainable solutions already exist. If we take a look at Starbucks, um, they were already pushing wireless information out to um, their clients. You'd come in, you'd turn on your laptop, and you'd be able to access Starbucks. I was trying to figure out how to allow my patients to be able to access the internet. I took a look at the, Star the Starbucks um, solution, and I, I implemented a wireless technology throughout our institution for free patient access. Um, that was about eight years ago. Today, if you walk into any hospital, that is now the standard. Um, back in the late um, 90s, I saw my UPS guy deliver a package to work, did a barcode scan, um, uploaded that into his computer and walked out. And I thought, wow, we could use that here. So I started developing in-house um, mobile computing solutions. I had physicians in 1999 carrying handheld devices around the hospital to be able to charge and track their patients. Serving customers. This is, this is key. I think this is the number one thing of every company, no matter what your goal is. Um, whether you're selling a product or a service, it's actually serving customers. Uh, I've served customers my entire life. Um, from, from Boy Scouts to my paper route to being a lifeguard, a statistician, a manager, an executive, um, selling software, developing software, all of it is actually customer focused. Um, one of the biggest revelations that I had um, that actually came about 10 years ago is we were working with a healthcare organization called Baptist Healthcare out of Pensacola, Florida that was the worst, num the worst rated customer service hospital in the country. Their CEO went to their employees and said, what do you want to be? And the employees said, we want to be number one. And the CEO laughed and said, what do you really want to be? And they said, we want to be number one. And so they implemented a, a huge process to get them there. And two of the things that I took away that I thought were huge was they did two things with, their, with every interaction that they had. Um, number one was they walked up to a patient and said, when they were done with the, the interacting with them, and they said, is there anything else we can do for you? We have the time. And that was, that was key because it made the patient feel they were not doing that. Second thing they asked him is, are you an owner or a renter? I think that the mentality of an owner is different than that of a renter. Um, we simply went back, even before we had implemented the process, we had said, hey guys, are you owners or renters here? And the next week, it was amazing to take a look at the employees and how they would stop and wipe up a spill, even though it wasn't in their area or their job. They would take a smudge and take it off, you know, wipe the smudge off the wall. They were picking up trash. We became a different organization by just thinking about, are you owners or are you renters? 
And it really is a big difference um, on how you do that. And, and so ever since then, for like the last 10 years, I've always viewed myself as an owner of whatever I'm doing. Managing projects and products and services. Um, for most of my career, I've been on the service side. Uh, like I said in the last slide, even while I was providing a product, the biggest, service, the biggest thing I provide is a service. Um, hospital information systems usually cost millions of dollars. Rarely do I hear a CEO or a CIO swapping out a million dollar healthcare solution because the product just wasn't good. It's usually because the service wasn't good. You can have a mediocre product with outstanding service and the hospital will continue to use it because they know when they've got the problem. The service is there to back it up. So I've always been a service or, or, uh, oriented kind of guy. Um, even when I was doing electronic medical records, what we provided was a service to the hospital to do their electronic medical records. I've done five-year strategic plans. Um, again, to be able to do that strategic plan, that's a product. Um, uh, I guess it's a service as well. Uh, as an IT manager, director, or even the VP of Information Systems, I would go out with my techs, swap out keyboards, swap out monitors. Um, I would do tech support a couple days a month um, for an hour or two, just so they knew that I was standing behind anything I asked them to do. I think that's, that's critical when you're a leader in an organization. Managing technology and innovation. I have been hugely lucky in my career to be able to play in the technology space for the last 30 years. Um, one of the things that I've realized is that technology is a solution to a problem and it's not a way cool thing to go try and find a problem to solve. Oftentimes IT folks are off to go do that. And in healthcare it's the same thing. Um, as a CEO, what's the problem? Let's solve it. Let's not try and find just way cool things to do at the hospital. Um, some of the technologies that I've implemented over, over my career is the computer program to calculate life cycle cost and um, design unit production cost as well as um, uh, the learning curve model. Uh, I've, I've created processes to ensure accuracy in pricing models. If you remember in the mid-80s, we had Department of Defense contracts that were charging thousands of dollars for toilet seats and hundreds of dollars for nuts, bolts, screws, and washers. So I created a program for the Department of, Fe Department of Defense to be able to monitor their, those and be able to track them so they're, they're more accurate. I was also part of the team that delivered the first wide area network email program uh, on the West Coast. And, and that was very exciting to be able to do that. We had a problem that needed solving, so we solved it. While an executive uh, of, a of a healthcare system, um, I was able to deploy a cutting edge wireless technology within my hospital that was not new to healthcare, um, that was not just new to healthcare, but was actually new to the whole wireless uh, industry. That was uh, about eight, nine years ago. And today, that is now the standard for all wireless technologies around the world. Uh, it was purchased by Cisco, and Cisco Systems now uses that as, as their key thing. Um, another technology is what I call a Star Trek communicator. We had uh, little um, cigarette lighter size devices that you wore on your lapel. You press a button, it was a voice activated at that point. You could say, call Western Governors University, and it would call Western Governors University. And you could talk back and forth. We found that we got our transportation folks about an hour, hour and a half back of their day that they used to spend finding a phone and calling in specific things. Um, a huge time saver. Um, not for everyone, but for if you're in the transportation world, it was huge. I also created the first wide area network between hospitals and cities. Um, our cities were, were very interested in connecting their um, community leaders, the community members, and the residents of their community with their hospital. And so we actually created a plan between three hospitals that were about 25 miles apart and um, three different cities to tie them all together. Assessing the competitive environment. One of the things about the, the competitive environment of a hospital is for the most part it's local. Um, you really can't travel hundreds of miles for your basic health care. Some people do. But really for the most part you go to your community hospital. Um, some patients will travel long distances if you have cancer or you have a very unique issue that they'll want to go to the leading medical center um, that could be thousands of miles away. When I was at Virginia Mason Medical Center, um, we had folks traveling across the, the, the 3,000 miles across the country to come in to get uh, their new knees put in. 
And so in that sense, it's done. But for the most part, if you're there for your care and feeding, it's within a, a central location. And so your competitor is pretty easy to spot. It's the hospital down the road. That's the easy part. The hard part is that your biggest competitor oftentimes isn't the hospital. It's new ideas and entities that pop up around the area. Outpatient services were huge in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, outpatient surgeries used to be done in a hospital, now they're done in an outpatient center. Infusions for blood and chemotherapies were done inside the hospital exclusively until a few years ago, and now it's done almost exclusively outside the hospital. Those were big profit centers that are now gone. That's competitive. Radiology centers. Most likely, if you've gone in for a radiology procedure that has been ordered by your physician, you don't go to the hospital. You go to an outpatient area. Again, big profit margins, I've now left the hospital. That's your competition. The other piece of competition is Medicare and insurance. Um, uh, they continue to, to try and decrease your, your revenues. So um, let's get back to the low-hanging fruit. So uh, the two hospitals I was at um, actually was, was part of the, the group that led a new surgical center being built for the hospital as well as a new radiology center being built for the hospital, both off-site, both freestanding. And so we were able to keep those revenues because we partnered with the radiologists and the surgeons to make sure those didn't walk out of our building. Planning for the future in a global marketplace. If you think about healthcare, healthcare really, for the most part, cannot be global. It's a hands, it's a hands-on procedure. Um, most likely, you cannot outsource your surgery. You cannot outsource your surgical team. Um, they need to be here, local. Now, that's the local part. But can you have cheap services that are outside that you can outsource to? You bet. Um, I have personally outsourced um, radiology reads by radiologists in the United Kingdom as well as Australia. Um, I outsource an ICU monitoring system uh, from the ICU over on the East Coast. Um, much better, much cheaper. We found that the um, ICU length of stays decreased because of that. It is very difficult for an intensivist to be monitoring all of those rooms in the ICU when they're also caring for patients. By outsourcing that, we had an intensivist sitting at a desk reviewing those monitors without the interruptions of the nurses and the patients. Save money, decrease length of stay, and we're able to uh, increase uh, patient satisfaction because the intensivist was actually spending time with the patient, not looking at monitors for all those other patients. So it is a global marketplace, and you can find solutions around the world, um, but most of those solutions really are going to remain inside those four walls of the hospital. In summary, I have 30 years of leader, leadership experience. That leadership experience is 20 years of that has been in the healthcare um, arena. Um, as a clinical manager, as an IT manager, um, as a consultant, as a process improvement um, technologist. Um, I, I've done many large-scale projects. I have many large-scale accomplishments, uh, entire IT systems, um, outsourcing large things like, like the ICU monitoring as well as, as Nighthawk. Um, other large-scale accomplishments have been to merge uh, ORs, operating rooms, by two major hospitals here in Seattle. Um, so I've got many large-scale accomplishments that could um, feed quite well into becoming a COO or a CEO. Outstanding customer service. For 30 years, I can show you over and over again where I've had uh, outstanding customer service and where my customers have, have really enjoyed working with me and have enjoyed the solutions I've brought to them. Uh, for the last 20 years in which I've been responsible for a P&L statement, um, I've had fi uh, successful, positive financial success on every one of those. I've either increased profits when I've actually been able to be a profit center, and I've decreased expenses at any point that I've been a cost center. I've been able to have a growth of industry solutions when I was manager of orthopedics, sports medicine, and rheumatology. I was able to extend the podiatry department to the point that we were profitable for the first time in 11 years. Um, all of my IT solutions have always come in under budget. It is something that I take great pride in to be able to say that, that my solutions work, and that uh, I'm cost effective. So I want to say thank you for uh, your time today, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. Have a great day.